Good evening. Welcome. Uh, I'm glad you could all come and attend the Horace Albright Lecture in Conservation. I'm Keith Gillis, Dean of the College of Natural Resources here at Berkeley and a professor of forestry. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors this evening, the Graduate School of Journalism, the Berkeley Water Center, and the Berkeley Institute for the Environment, and the CNR Alumni Association. So last year, we passed the 50 year mark for the Albright Lecture Series, um, which was created in commemoration of the remarkable career and accomplishments of Horace Albright. Thanks to the recent Ken Burns documentary on the National Parks, America's Best Idea, I think more people than ever are aware of the critical role that Horace Albright played, perhaps the single most significant person in the evolution of the national park system in the US and its mission. Um, and our speaker tonight will be adding his name to a distinguished list of speakers who have come here celebrating Horace Albright's career. He's been preceded by Ansel Adams. Uh, I spoke recently to someone that was at the Ansel Adams speech. It was apparently quite, quite remarkable. Carl Pope, Paul and Ann Ehrlich, and many others from government, from industry, from the nonprofit world, including the remarkable David Brower, whose name uh, is on the outside of this building. And I'm very pleased to welcome Chris Johns, the Editor-in-Chief of National Graphic, to Berkeley and to the Albright Series tonight. I think he is a, a wonderful addition to that list of speakers and a good start on our next half century. Let me tell you very briefly a little about Chris before we get started. He graduated with a degree in technical journalism and a minor in agriculture from Oregon State University. I learned at noon today in the journalism school at the pizza lunch we had that that may have been precipitated by a, a close encounter of the negative type with organic chemistry. <laughs> um, but I'm sure it was really in his blood all along. Uh, he went on to a master's degree in photojournalism from the University of Minnesota. Um, and in 1975, became the staff photographer at the Topeka, Kansas Capital Journal. In 1979, was named the National Newspaper Photographer of the Year. In the early 80s, he worked at the Seattle Times as a picture editor and special projects photographer. Soon after that, became a freelance photographer working for the likes of Life, Time, and National Geographic. He joined the National Geographic staff in 1995. Uh, ten years later, in 2005, he became their editor-in-chief. Tonight, he's going to talk with you about a special April issue of National Geographic devoted to water, an issue that certainly is at the core of the scholarship of many of the students and faculty at Berkeley and in my college. Welcome, Chris. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Keith. It is really an honor for me to be here tonight uh, as a participant in the Albright Lecture Series. Uh, Horace Albright, uh, as Keith said, uh, started in 1916 the National Park Service. And that makes him a, a kindred spirit to National Geographic because we were actively involved with Horace uh, in pushing the National Park Service and the National Parks. In fact, uh, Sequoia National Park would most likely not have occurred when it did if the National Geographic magazine hadn't given $20,000 in uh, extra funding to get that park off the ground. Uh, we were also involved in the creation of Redwoods National Park. So our DNA goes deep uh, with Horace Albright and our sense of values and I think our sense of mission are very much in step with uh, why we're all here this evening and all gathered in honor of Horace Albright and the good things that he did for all of us. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be in the David Brower building here tonight as well. When I was a junior in college, uh, yes, I was taking organic chem for the second time. <laughs> uh, and I just really wasn't sure that I wanted that in my head. Uh, I knew there was a finite amount of space, and I wasn't sure that this was really what I needed in there. Uh, I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to go to the University of California, Davis, actually, to vet school. Um, but at that time, I, I took a journalism class 
from a professor uh, in our Department of Journalism at Oregon State, Ron Lovell, who's a close friend. And he turned me on to a world of possibilities. And then I took a photography class from the chairman of the uh, Department of Journalism, which was accredited at the time, uh, and fell in love with photography. And that same year, I read a book by one of my famous, favorite writers, John McPhee. And it was called Encounters, Encounters with the Arch Druid. It was published in 1971. And it was a story that really caught my fancy about David Brower going down with Floyd Domino. Domini, thank you. Floyd Domini from the Bureau of Reclamation. And they floated down the Colorado River. You remember the John McPhee's book? And, yes, and it was a New Yorker piece uh, uh, at first. And uh, I, I was just fascinated with this ongoing discussion because Floyd obviously loved building dams. I mean, this was just uh, uh, you know, uh, an illustration of the power of human beings that we could build uh, a dam. And of course, David Brower uh, disagreed with him. And, and I thought it was brilliant for John McPhee to put them in this boat together and <laughs> go down the Colorado River. Uh, and of course, uh, it's in keeping with the, the great tradition of journalism that John McPhee has, has given us. Um, and of course, David Brower, to his death in 2000, regretted the Glen Canyon Dam in particular, felt, I, I believe it was one of the biggest mistakes that he'd seen uh, in his career. And of course, that was about water. So tonight, let's talk about water in honor of, of a man uh, who accomplished a great deal and certainly made me, through John McPhee, uh, think about water in different ways. And John McPhee helped me think about journalism uh, in new ways as well. What I'd like to do is start off with a, with a, with a quick video. So if we could knock down the lights, we'll roll the video. Can we take these lights down in front? Thank you.
When we decided at National Geographic Magazine to devote an entire issue uh, to water, we didn't uh, gather focus groups and ask people what kind of subject matter they wanted to see in National Geographic Magazine. We didn't go to an advertising agency and say, how can we sell more ads for National Geographic Magazine? Would, would a, uh, a special issue devoted to water help us uh, in the advertising market in these challenging times? We didn't go to a research company. That's not where it started to do an issue with, devoted entirely to water. It started uh, in 1991 in a small church in rural Virginia, right by Shenandoah National Park. It was a beautiful spring afternoon, and I'm holding my daughter, who's about a year old, and an Episcopal priest is putting holy water on her head. And I notice as the early morning light streaming into the stained glass windows, the reflections of the light on the beads of water on her head. I was a photographer for National Geographic magazine back then, and I was just struck at the absolute beauty of this image. And I knew that we were planning a 13th issue for November of 1993 on water in North America. So I thought, wouldn't it be terrific? What an opportunity for a photographer to go out and do an essay on this deep spiritual connection humankind has with water that manifests, manifests itself in all kinds of rituals, ceremonies. What a delight. So I'm a pretty intense guy, so for the next two or three days, I completely immersed myself in every bit of research I could on the spirituality of water. I got an appointment with the editor of National Geographic magazine, and I said, I know we're planning this issue on water, and I would like it to have a very strong human component. And I laid out my pitch for the spirituality of water, and he immediately said no. <laughs> now I'm the editor of the magazine. <laughs> and that, in all honesty, was the seeds, that experience with my daughter, of the water issue. Now, I tell you this story because uh, there are a lot of reasons to do an issue entirely devoted to water. In 2025, 1.8 million people will not have adequate fresh water. Uh, that is most likely going to occur. There's something we can do about it, and we'll talk about that. But it really started with water as life and how deeply connected all of us are with water in so many ways and so many unseen ways. And it's very important for us as journalists to help people understand some of the incredible challenges humankind faces today that are in many ways unprecedented. Next year, seven billion people will be on this planet in 2011. That the ramifications of that are absolutely huge. And the challenge we have, and my predecessor Bill Allen, the editor of the magazine, used to say, what we have to do is, is invite people in through their door and they come out through our door. Meaning that if we do a special issue on water or on any, any subject, and it becomes a finger wag, and we are lecturing people about the state of the planet and the dire straits we're in, et cetera, et cetera, we won't be heard. And if there's one thing I want at National Geographic Magazine, we reach 40 million people a month, approximately, in 33 languages. I want our voice and the voices of the people we bring to life on the pages of the magazine heard. We have, we, have to, we have to get there. So that was really how the water issue started, was through a common experience that we all share. And then we can talk about some of the important and terribly pressing issues we have with water. 
So this is our cover. Uh, Bill Maher designed this. Uh, Bill was the first person I hired when I became editor. I've been editor for about two hours, and I called up Bill and I said, I want uh, this magazine to be absolutely beautiful. And it always has been beautiful, but we want to every month make it more beautiful, and we'll never apologize for making a beautiful magazine. That's part of the National Geographic experience. Another uh, part of National Geographic that's deep in our DNA is, is community. Uh, in reality, you don't subscribe to National Geographic magazine. You're a member of the National Geographic Society, and you get the magazine. So one of the things we wanted badly to do with uh, the proliferation of digital photography was to have a community site for photography, for people to come in and share their pictures. So uh, it's, it's been one of the biggest traffic drivers on the web. Uh, it's just astonishing the quality of, of photography we get from our readers. So we, we uh, at the top, that's our pick for one of the best pictures. Of course, we themed the entire issue for April and Water. This is in China. This is in the Everglades, down below. This, these are the, uh, during the great fires in Australia, that's Sydney. And here, we've got it right here. Ethan Daniels from Berkeley, California, <laughs> submitted a picture in Palau of a coconut germinating coconut bobbing in the water. Very, I think, a terrific, terrific picture. The other thing we wanted to do was uh, address photography, and of course photography is part of our core as well. And we ask our photographers to submit their favorite rain pictures. And of course any uh, photographer of, of, of any note loves bad weather. I mean, it, it, it's exciting, it's great. I mean, I, 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 it was, this morning was, uh, in Berkeley would have been a great day to shoot pictures. Uh, this is uh, in, in the Flint Hills in Kansas by Jim Richardson. Pascal Maitre, this is in Chad. Randy Olson, uh, a farmer in Australia. Jody Cobb at, at Broadway, Times Square. Sam Abel in Hage, Japan. Alex Webb. Uh, in the Brazilian rainforest, and Bill Allard uh, hanging out again at a cafe in Paris. This is Laos. Uh, another one of the most popular sections of our magazine is called Visions of Earth. We usually have three uh, spreads like this. We bumped it up to four to celebrate the water issue. And of course, isn't this a place we'd like to be? This so is in Western India. I average about eight inches of rain a year. And of course, this is, uh, certainly illustrates in this part of the world the scarcity of water. Uh, degrees, uh, it's not unusual for it to be 115 degrees there. It's the Kimberley area uh, in Australia. This meander we he see here is about 72 miles long. And of course, during the dry season, there's no water. This is a, a picture I found fascinating. Uh, when uh, bromide and chlorine react with UVA sunlight, it produces a carcinogen. So uh, this is in Los Angeles. And there are three million black balls that are put on this reservoir to try to stop that sunlight to producing bromide, a, a carcinogen. Who would have guessed? Only in LA, right? <laughs> Uh, our department's uh, section of the magazine was all uh, water themed as well. And in this case, uh, there's an interesting story here that if, if, if children spend 20 seconds washing their hands with soap and water, it could save the life of 3.5 million children a year from diarrheal diseases, from pneumonia, uh, from a variety of, of diseases. 20 minutes and a bar of soap. I mean, 20 seconds, excuse me, in a bar of soap. This is collecting water uh, outside of Lima, Peru. They cut down most of the forest in this village just outside Lima. And they started, uh, uh, they, they were spending about 15%, the villagers were spending about 15% of their income just getting water. So what they did was they, they put up these uh, devices here as catchment, as the trees had done, and now they have an excess 
of water. And this is happening in Eritrea, it's happening all over the world. And then for those of us who are, are constantly complaining about water bottles, here's the bright side of a water bottle. Uh, if you put water in these bottles, this is just outside uh, Nairobi, in a Nairobi slum, and you keep that water out as it's displayed here for six hours, uh, the water will be safe to drink. Uh, now what's interesting is, before they started this program, uh, only about 10 to 15 percent of the kids were passing the sixth grade. And now that they've got clean water and they're coming to school, about 90 percent of the kids are passing the sixth grade in the slum. And that's the difference water can make. And of course, 97.5 of, of the water in the world is salt water. So we decided to do a short on uh, getting the salt out. And uh, there are about 16 billion uh, gallons of water are, are produced daily by uh, roughly 15,000 desalinization plants. Um, but of course, it's extremely expensive to do. And of course, California has been in, in, uh, done some of the most cutting edge research about it. And we, we go on and talk in the big ideas section of our magazine as to how we can use technology to take uh, the salt uh, out of water and, and make it a fresh potable water. This is a, uh, a celebration again of the beauty of water. This is uh, the Boundary Waters in Minnesota during a rainstorm. This is a waterfall on the border of Brazil and Argentina. 1.6 million gallons of water a minute come down this waterfall. Bangladesh, watering a crop in Iceland. And of course, that delightful baby with probably roughly 75% water in his or her body. Then we did something that ha has not been done before and we we used some uh, cutting edge data and mapped uh, every stream, freshwater stream in the world. Uh, and believe it or not, this, this, had never, this had never been done before. So uh, it makes, it, it, it looks like arteries, of course, and, and, and really that's, that's what it is. And then water is art. This is a 90 foot waterfall uh, below the Brooklyn Bridge. And as I just mentioned a minute ago, 70% of the world's fresh water is uh, uh, locked up in ice. And this is uh, in Antarctica. Now one thing we've done in this issue is we're dealing with a lot of, of dense material. And, and that's part of our stock and trade. But we want to make that as attractive and as inviting as it can possibly be. So throughout the issue, you'll see pages designed like this with just facts. Interesting facts. The, the term that uh, some of our editors use, this is sort of cocktail chatter. I mean, just really interesting stuff that uh, you can share with people, yet can be incredibly revealing, but not be too dense. Uh, this is a water park uh, in Mumbai, India. This young lady uh, is in Luanda, Angola, and she's selling that bag of fresh water for 10 cents. Uh, it's a slum just outside Luanda. And in that slum in 2006, 80,000 people became sick with cholera within a matter of days. This is Mr. Noda in uh, uh, Osaka, Japan. And uh, He's 72 years old, and he feels that this soaking is what gives him such a healthy, long, hopefully long life. So now we move to the roof of the world. Uh, this is the, uh, the headwaters of the Yellow River, a little boy, Tibetan boy throwing up prayer flags. And then this is downstream uh, in Delhi at a slum, water being trucked in. More than 25% of 
of the world's population depends on the Tibetan Plateau for water. And there it is from Mount Everest to 27,000 feet. Some people call it the third pole. And here's a glacier in 1921 on the flanks of Mount Everest. And here's that same glacier in 2008. We can discuss later global climate change if you'd like. That's a fact. Doesn't have anything to do with the emails in the UK or anything. <laughs> That's a fact. Indisputable fact. We'd like facts at National Geographic. And this, of course, is mapping the third pole, the, the roof of the world that feeds many of the great rivers. Now, as that ice melts downstream in Bangladesh, you've got rising waters, coupled with, of course, rising sea levels. In the upper left here, uh, in the Tibetan Plateau, they're burning uh, dung and wood, and they produce black carbon. And black carbon, of course, settles on the snow, and you start uh, a feedback loop of increased melting. Uh, that snow, being a darker color, melts faster. Uh, you'll get more water downstream, at least temporarily. This city in China has 31 million people in it, and that's the Yangtze River over on the left. This is Tajikistan, which has the highest uh, per capita consumption of water in the world. And why is that? Because they grow cotton there. And these are women in New Delhi waiting for hours to get fresh water. Bangladesh again, flooding. And then we go to the essay that I wanted to shoot uh, on sacred waters. And this is a, a cenote in uh, Mexico and the Yucatan that the Mayans have been coming to for hundreds if not thousands of years for spiritual nourishment. It looks like a place I'd like to be. Uh, a Laotian woman on the Mekong River uh, celebrating the new year, bringing in the new year in April. A baptism in Istanbul Uh, this is in Maine, uh, an Orthodox, a Russian Orthodox church where they've cut a, a cross in the ice. And then this is a Hasidic Jew in Ukraine uh, in taking a spiritual bath in uh, sacred water. A Shinto a ceremony in Japan under a sacred waterfall. And of course, you've got to have a photograph of the Ganges River. Uh, Muslims washing before prayers in Istanbul, and lords in southern France, where six million people come a year for the healing waters there. And Haiti. One of the stories that uh, we felt very strongly about was to talk about uh, the term that's often used as water slaves. Women who may spend anywhere from six to 12 hours a day gathering water. And of course, the social and cultural implications of this are huge. That means these women uh, have to walk uh, about five miles to and from their village to get water. So, and then once they, we'll see pictures in a minute, it shows how arduous it is to even get the water once you're there. So they can't go to school. They can't get an education. I mean, this affects birth rates. This affects the quality of, of, of the culture. Uh, it has huge ramifications. It's in northern Kenya. And here's a woman down a ladder deep in a well, and they're hauling water up to one another to take back to their families. And of course, you see children out here doing this. They have to do it. But of course, again, that child's not in school. He's a, uh, she's of school age. You've got uh, some very serious issues here. This is in Ethiopia, in the Ethiopian highlands, waiting for maybe two hours to get that much water seeping in the sand. And of course, another big issue throughout the world, in this case, it's Ethiopia, is sanitation, water sanitation. 
And in this case, the woman's laughing because she's trying to describe uh, to these school children how important it is where you defecate. It was a big discussion we were writing the caption, what word we use for defecate. So we ended up with defecate. <laughs> I hope I didn't offend anybody, but it happens. And uh, it's actually a delightful moment as, as this uh, Ethiopian woman's just trying to, to get the message across. And then here is a, is a, is a village that with some funding with an NGO has uh, built, is building their own water line into their village so they can not have this arduous trip every day uh, simply to get water for their families. And you saw the video of this. This is in 30 minutes. This is a product by a, an outfit called Pure, P-U-R. And if you can take water with a high degree of sediment, and in 30 minutes, uh, it will settle the sediment out. You can screen it out. And we drank this water. Several of us drank this water. And we're here to talk about it. Nobody got sick. And here, what we've done is, is again, to break up sort of the density of the magazine, uh, talk about uh, where water is the most expensive in the world. Copenhagen is quite expensive uh, per 100 gallons. You can see where it's much less expensive. And of course, there are places, for example, like uh, Mexico City where water's cheap, but you could make the argument it shouldn't be cheap in Mexico City. You can make the argument that Mexico City shouldn't even be where it is from a water sustainability standpoint. Uh, and I, I always thought the Sapiro uh, in, in uh, Japan must be for beer, because it's, it's quite a good beer. So I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but interesting stuff. Here we are at a, a Abrams Creek in Tennessee, searching for uh, a little endemic catfish. And, and uh, natural history is one of our stock and trades at the magazine. We love to cover it. We've got David Lichwager, who's done uh, with us tonight, who's done a terrific story on one cubic foot. That's a testament to uh, biodiversity to evolution. He went uh, to how many locations? Five? Five locations throughout the world and, and surveyed the life in one cubic foot. If, if for those of you who are National Geographic subscribers, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed David's story. For those of you who are not, you should subscribe. And you'll see more of his work. He's doing a terrific piece right now on ocean acidification and tide pools. This is a uh, endangered sturgeon. This is a project that Joel Sartori, one of our photographers, has been working on for years. It's a snake-necked turtle, smiling. <laughs> Very charismatic fellow. And a little less charismatic is this Chinese salamander, which is the world's largest salamander. An interesting little fact. There are more fish species in, in fresh water than in all the oceans. And of course, you've got a high, high, much, much bigger volume in oceans of, of water. It just goes to show you the diversity in fresh water, much of it threatened. This is uh, just sort of a, uh, a fun thing. I, this is one of my favorite statistics. The weight of China's Three Gorges Reservoir will tilt the Earth's axis by nearly an inch. Is that good? <laughs> I wonder about that. I don't, and, and, and then we uh, talk about uh, uh, water tower art in United uh, Emirates there, the United Arab Emirates. This is Haskell County, Kansas, the site of the 1930s Dust Bowl. Uh, but it's not a Dust Bowl, at least now, because of irrigation in the Ogallala Aquifer. And there are more than 1,100 uh, wells just pumping away in the Okalala aquifer. There's just one problem. It's fossil water and it's not being recharged nearly as quickly as it's being taken out. So who knows how much longer we can do that. But it is not sustainable agriculture. And we have that animated actually. If you've got your iPad you can see that animated uh, uh, on your iPad. Lake Shasta, this is where I uh, learned to water ski. It was not pretty, but I had a lot of fun at Lake Shasta. And now what we've done, and I'm not going to talk too much about this story because there are a lot of people in this room who know a lot more about this than I do. But it basically, the story is about plumbing California. 
the long history of bringing water, obviously, from the north down south. This is the uh, All-American Canal. What's it, about 72 miles long, I think. And of course, once the canal was lined, there was great savings in water. Billions of gallons were saved a year. The Imperial Valley. We had a, a, a very well-known photographer, Ed Bertinsky, uh, do these grand uh, photographs with, with large format cameras. And what is it, about half of the vegetables, fruit and nuts, produced in the United States are produced in California. In fact, if, if, please call me out. What, what did I say? But isn't it vegetables too? Okay, all right. We'll, we'll stick to fruits and nuts, okay? Thank you, thank you. This is Los Angeles, of course. And uh, up uh, in the picture in the upper, we have Owens Lake, which I think you're all familiar with the environmental disaster of Owens Lake. And of course, another, some would say potential disaster in the uh, Sacramento Delta, San Joaquin Delta. We're mapping the plumbing of California. And then this is a picture I love. Uh, this is in the Sacramento Delta. And, and what I love is right here, we've got swimming pools. <laughs> You know, because I don't know about you, but I'm not swimming in that water. I really don't need my daily dose of nitrogen and all the other uh, runoff that's in there. Uh, but I mean, these, these floating swimming pools, that is really interesting. And here we have uh, the Salton City. I, I heard that the Rat Pack was interested uh, in, in, the, in their heyday about buying uh, property there. I don't know what property values are there, but I'm not too interested in moving there. And then we, we talk uh, again about uh, the joy of water. Then we took a fish that came out of Chicago's North Shore Channel, and we, we wanted to see what was in that fish. And it turns out the fish uh, has uh, antidepressants in it, uh, it's got uh, antihistamines in it. It has all kinds of uh, things that it ingested uh, as we flush the toilet and flush our medicines away. Uh, this is, I thought, uh, one of our youngest staff members came up with this idea of, of those are actually the pills that uh, would represent uh, those, uh, those chemical compounds, those pharmaceuticals. Then we, we start to wrap up uh, the, the issue with w one of the oldest stories in the world, and of course that's the Jordan River and the Middle East. Uh, this is uh, at the Sea of Galilee, a Palestinian uh, couple. Actually one of my favorite issues, m one of my favorite photographs in the issue. It's where Jesus was baptized uh, on the Jordan River, the headwaters of the Jordan River, and then mapping the Jordan River. This reservoir uh, is about uh, a fifth uh, of its capacity. Uh, it, it's dropping dramatically. And of course, this is one of the big issues in the Middle East, is, is the battle over, over water and water rights. So uh, this is a, bananas being grown in one of the most arid places in the world. Bananas, of course, a very thirsty crop. One wonders why bananas are grown there, but uh, they're enjoying them, I suppose. And then we've got the Palestinians with water trucked in, and of course the Israelis uh, have more water. And this is a, a Palestinian and Israeli arguing over water and land in the Middle East. And then a beautiful picture of the Dead Sea. Then we, we close the issue talking about water and civilization. And that actually, if, if you go back and look at how many civilizations have handled water, you'll see civilizations that crashed because of poor water management, and you'll see civilizations that thrived. And these are uh, in Arizona. But th th this is water management uh, that Native Americans did successfully for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And then water is art. Then we, uh, we did a large supplement map uh, 
similar to the map I showed you earlier where we mapped all the major, uh, well, the tributaries of the world, the rivers of the world, and all the tributaries. And then we talk about uh, the water footprint, nearly 1,900 gallons of water to, to grow a pound of, produce a pound of beef, blue jeans, all of these things in a large supplement map. We do several of those a year. So with that, uh, I would love to uh, answer questions. I'd uh, love to hear what you think. Thank you. Um, just a word to you about asking questions. We have Mike in the audience here. Um, please raise your hand and I'll let you pick uh, people, but please use the mic even if you think your voice is loud enough because otherwise it won't pick up on the video for people that watch this later or uh, the people that are watching in the overflow area won't be able to put Chris's answer in context if you don't use the mic, so. Okay. Complaints are welcome too. Arguments? Yes. Uh, when I was growing up, National Geographic was always very beautiful, and, um, um, but didn't really focus on relevant issues. Um, and obviously, um, you're highly relevant, and you're, it's still beautiful, um, but you've, you've transitioned to be very highly socially responsible. I've, we've, I've been getting the magazine for 50 years, so I know this. So can you talk about the transition toward, um, I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, by the way, I'm not from Berkeley, so. <laughs> um, but, but it's quite remarkable how, how you are now dealing with the, the real issues um, that are confronting the planet at this point in time, and you didn't used to do that. So can you talk a little bit about that transition I'm in the magazine, obviously, as editor and sure. as a photographer, you must be aware of this. this is Ab absolutely. Uh, and, and we get letters about it, because not everyone's happy about it. I mean, certainly the, 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 uh, the majority of our readers are very happy. Uh, and and, and uh, some of the toughest stories uh, that we've done, some of the hardest hitting stories we've done, especially on the environment, have been some of our most popular stories, uh, which is uh, where, where we want to be. Uh, we want to be a thought leader. We want to be relevant. Uh, and especially with, with the challenges that uh, all media faces right now, with the proliferation of websites, with uh, the proliferation of cable channels, with, with a much more fragmented audience out there, um, we want to be a place you can come to. And, and, and not only fragmented, but I think in many ways a more polarized audience in many ways, especially relative to. Uh, environmental issues like global climate change. We want to be a place where people know we don't have a political agenda, that we, uh, we have a curiosity uh, about this world, and we want to try to do the right thing as a nonprofit organization. We are, of course, a nonprofit institution. Uh, the, as far as the transition goes to becoming a, a more relevant magazine, that started uh, a while ago. Uh, it started uh, to some degree with Gil Grosvenor. And uh, uh, when he was the editor of the magazine, he's the great, great grandson of Alexander Graham Bell, wonderful man. And he uh, did really one of the first stories decades ago on the cutting down of the world's rainforests, on acid rain. And then I think what's happened since then is, is we found that that's a real sweet spot with our readers. And they, uh, they, they want that kind of information. Um, so we have, uh, definitely become, I think, a more journalistic publication and uh, a, a publication that doesn't have an agenda but does have a point of view. And by a point of view, what I want to do as editor of the magazine, and this has been true for, uh, I, th I think, the recent editors of National Geographic magazine, there have only been nine, um, is, is to give a voice, for example, to uh, the people of southern Sudan who are caught in the middle of a of a crossfire uh, by an extraordinarily uh, brutal regime in Khartoum and uh, the demand for oil and the demand for water. In this case, probably more uh, 
a, a bigger demand for oil at this point in time. And to give those people a voice, but not just give those people a voice, but to give even the landscape a voice, the cultural voice. And, and what George kept saying when he came back from southern Sudan and Matt Teague said the same thing was, nobody else is here. Nobody else is covering this. And it's, ex it's ex an extraordinary story. We did, we did a story on the murder of the mountain gorillas in Virunga in uh, July of 2007. And man, this was a tough story. It dealt with uh, a corrupt government in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It dealt with uh, a park ranger, the park warden, who uh, controlled the mafia charcoal trade, which was millions. He framed one of his best rangers in the murder of these gorillas. These were an execution of gorillas. This story was a tough story. It had to do with the Rwanda genocide. It had to do with the Hutus and the Tutsis and, and rebel groups throughout one of the, the, some would say the most biodiverse park in the world, Virunga National Park. We put the grill on the cover and it was one of the highest rated stories in our readership survey we've done. And it also did very well in single copy sales in the newsstand. So we know there's a hunger out there for good, responsible journalism. And in, in particular, as there have been these cutbacks in journalism, uh, in science reporting and environmental journalism have really suffered, at least in the United States. And I, I think you could say the same for a good deal of Asia and Europe uh, because of these cutbacks and these challenging economic times. And that presents, I, I, I'm not happy about that, but it does present an opportunity for us uh, to, to do these kinds of stories. But again, it's got to be uh, not a finger wag. It, there's got to be, also when we, we, we do these stories, we generally have six stories in every magazine, five to six stories. And if we do that tough Virunga gorilla story, or we do that tough Southern Sudan story, we will also do stories that celebrate uh, the spirit of humankind, the goodness we all have in us, and celebrate the beauty of the world and the wonder of the world. And I, I'll make no apologies about that. Uh, I read a review uh, the other day um, of a book about Henry Luce, uh, and it was written by uh, Bill Keller, who's the executive editor of, of the New York Times. And he said, you know, most great e uh, editors, and Harold Ross, the editor of the New Yorker, who came from Aspen, Colorado, and didn't have much more than an eighth grade education, and did one of the most, of course, is one of the most elite magazines in the world, and Henry Luce, uh, what these guys had in common was a, a sense of curiosity and sort of an uh, unabashed wonderment about the world. And I, and I think at National Geographic, we have that too. And it's very important that, that our magazine um, project that. And, and that the, you don't pick up the magazine and, and feel helpless. That's, that's not our intention. But I will tell you this, one of the biggest struggles we have at the magazine is finding the balance between the seriousness of the problems that David Brower addressed years ago that have become, I mean, can you imagine some of the fights we're having now? What David Brower would think if he was still alive? You know, climate change? I mean, you've got to be kidding. Every day I get a letter from one of our readers chastising me for being a liberal in bed with Al Gore because we cover climate change. I mean, look at the glaciers. Look at the CO2 up in the atmosphere. What we have to do then is figure out how to be incredibly smart about how we talk about climate change. But thank you. It, it, uh, your comments are, are, are terribly important to me. Your I really appreciate that. Your still unbelievably fabulous. I mean, this is, well, I, I mean, you know, and now, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. you, you do it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of the things that you made mention in your April issue is that a lot of the treated um, clean fresh water in the world is lost due to transport pipe leakage. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you know of any movements afoot in some of the water stressed megacities to make the repair of aging water infrastructures a priority. There are a lot of NGOs uh, in, in, involved in that issue. I mean, it, it's, it's astonishing um, the degree of water loss in, in, in uh, a lot of municipal uh, water systems. Um, but but th th there's an active um, group of NGOs that, that 
uh, work in that area. But of course, a lot of this too is just enlightenment, is, is investment in infrastructure. And you know, sadly, in the United States, we, uh, we, we have some real homework to do and some catching up to do on infrastructure in that very uh, way. But I, I think the, uh, I'd have to go back and look at the magazine, but it, I, I remember just by the lining of, of the All-American Canal in California, saved billions and billions of, of, of gallons of water a year. S someone in here may know the exact figure if you got a, a, the magazine in front of you, uh, it would tell you. But that's a, that's a good point. Yes. So I, I realize the delicate position you're in with your 40 million readers and their various uh, views. And um, a lot of people, including me, read an article and say, well, I want to do something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know they can run off and talk to their Congress people, or you might have forums on your website. I'm not quite sure. But have you thought of doing a, a feature of, you know, we did this article two years ago and on these gorillas, and this is what happened since then. Have you thought of doing an update on your stories for people that are reading the magazine? A absolutely, and of course, this is part of the beauty of new media. I mean, this is something we can do uh, with tablets like the iPad. It's very easy for us then to go back and do uh, sort of the archive and an update from the archive. Uh, we, we did, we did uh, a section in the magazine shortly after I became editor called Something the Effect of How You Can Help. And it was interesting because our readers responded, uh, didn't respond to it well at all. Um, uh, which which uh, was curious to me, because we know they're engaged, we know they care, but for some reason uh, that, that didn't resonate. But the opportunities we have, not just with the web, but with uh, iPhone apps and, and the apps that'll, that'll continue to come out for the iPad and, and uh, smartphones, uh, tablet devices, I think really present an opportunity for uh, for the ability to expand on that. I mean, you know, I've got a finite number of pages in my magazine each month, and it comes out once a month. You know, on an iPad, why wouldn't we have a National Geographic update with your subscription every day uh, with, with photography, with, with pictures of the day, with, with uh, issues that you should be thinking about, or issues that we may have been working on, like the water issue we worked on for, for two and a half years. But uh, the other part of National Geographic that, that uh, deserves mention is, as I mentioned, we're nonprofit, but we do make money. And, and at National Geographic Magazine, we take pride in the fact that we make money. Uh, and that money is poured back into what we call our missions program. And we offer thousands, uh, have, have for years offered scientific grants in all kinds of disciplines, we, from Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall, Louis Leakey, Tim White from the University of California, Berkeley here. Uh, with er, er, his significant early man discoveries, uh, we, 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 we do that. So that's another way of giving. And then, for example, the water issue, we have a woman named Sandra Posto, uh, who is, a, is a, uh, what we call a National Geographic Fellow, and she's helping our missions program work on projects that will help uh, people become enlightened about uh, water and then really help people get clean water. I mean, we, we, we very well may be working on municipal water supplies and lobbying there. The other thing is when you've got the kind of reach National Geographic does, it's real interesting how you can move the dial. Uh, when when the, the huge uh, uh, preserve was started in Northwest Hawaiian Islands, the Marine uh, Protected Area that uh, George W. Bush signed, he said that, that it was the story that he read in National Geographic magazine that talked about the magnificence of this area and some of the challenges of this area. and that really helped push through that legislation. Early this year, we did a story on the Asian wildlife trade that was really tough on Malaysia. I mean, really tough on Malaysia. The corruption there is rampant. Uh, it, it involves everything from tigers to uh, snakes to, I mean, it, it's just astonishing what was going on there. And uh, I just got an email day before yesterday that uh, that article so rattled uh, politicians in Malaysia that they are, are are, have fired uh, a multitude of people and are, are recasting legislation to try to stamp it out because in large part they're worried about the uh, tourism and economic uh, interest there. But we were able to move the dial and with the, the, the kind of voice and circulation we have, we take that really seriously. But it also means that we're going to be very serious about research, uh, fact checking in our magazine and really when we step into those controversial stories, 
uh, really devote the time and the energy to try to get the story right. About 20% uh, of my staff is just a research staff and fact-checking staff. And for those of, 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 of you and, and, and uh, uh, Claire, for example, is, is working with us on a, on a very hard-hitting story, Madagascar. Madagascar is, uh, I mean, you want to get depressed? <laughs> We can talk about Madagascar. I mean, it, it's just shocking what's happening to Madagascar in the rosewood trade, in biodiversity, in uh, the eating of lemurs. I mean, you name it. Um, this is an island that is under tremendous stress. And, and uh, just today, Claire was showing me a, a map that she's trying to help us get right because we've got to get it right. And if we get something wrong, then we lose credibility. And our reputation is built on credibility and trust. We had a few passed in questions, um, and they've run along two themes. Um, one is simply a question about the international scope of the journal of, of the National Geographic, and is your international presence essentially uniform? Are things simply does the Spanish edition look just like the one that we're reading here? So, how different is your presence in different countries? Uh, some of our discussion last night would be sure, interesting there. Sure. Okay. Um, yes, we, we're, we're published in 33 languages, it'll soon be 34, and the 34th will be Arabic, uh, which will be really interesting <laughs> uh, because it won't be uh, the same magazine, trust me, that is uh, delivered uh, to all of you in the United States. Um, we, we, we're very careful about the brand, uh, National Geographic. And uh, we journalists tend to look at the brand as, you know, the brand, this isn't the brand, it's a magazine, it's an organic, you know, living entity, this, this magazine, don't call it a brand. Uh, but I, 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 I took a very intensive course a few years ago at the uh, Northwestern University in the executive media training course with people from all over the world, uh, a five week course. And I asked one of the professors, well, what's, the, I'm tired of hearing about the brand, what's the brand? And she said, well, a brand is a promise kept. So I get that. So at National Geographic, we have a, have a promise of, of, of authenticity, of, of accuracy, of hopefully telling that elusive thing called the truth, um, all of that. Uh, so so we, we do monitor, and, 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 and we're supposed to approve any changes or any edit they make. But um, that, that's not an easy thing. Um, especially, for example, we have our German partners. That's our biggest issue. And the Germans know a lot more about everything than I do. Uh, the, the, the French uh, are, are, are generally in, just from what I can gather, a complete state of confusion. Uh, the Poles do some of the most bizarre things. I mean, these stereotypes comes through, and I think this can't be right, but uh, it is. The Dutch uh, do precisely our magazine, and I love the Dutch. They're, 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 they're great. Uh, the Ch we have a Chinese edition, and I have a lot of trouble getting along with the Chinese. They tell me uh, we were doing a story on the Uyghurs, in December, it was uh, nominated for a National Magazine Award, and they said, uh, you do that Uyghur story, we're not gonna run it. I said, no, you don't have to run it. And they said, but you can't run it either. And I said, oh really? <laughs> That's interesting. You know, I didn't realize you were editing the magazine. And uh, so we had quite a go around, and they said, well, you know, you, uh, you work with News Corp with distribution of your channel, we're gonna shut you out of China. We're going to shut down all the magazines, and we're going to shut down News Corp. And I said, fine. And our CEO, God bless his soul, said, you know, if that's what I got to deal with to deal with China, to hell with it. He said, we can pull everything out of there. We're not making any money anyway. You can't trust any of uh, the figures they give us on circulation or advertising or anything. He said, you know, I don't care. And uh, so we, we, we uh, went ahead and published this story. They didn't publish this story. They, they wrote me a letter saying that I was a terrorist because uh, I was supporting these Islamic extremists, the, the Uyghurs, and uh, they, they now will not give us any official visas uh, to get into China to photograph or write about anything. Uh, but that's okay, because we'll get in there anyway. I'm not worried about that. It's no problem. But, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going on the other, si the other side here. But, you know, the fact is, yes, you've got these skirmishes and some head scratchers, but the fact is we're reaching people, and, that, and that's, that's, uh, it's not necessarily a huge money maker for us, but that's not why National Geographic Magazine exists. It, it's, it's to reach people, uh, to try to help people understand and appreciate the world we live in. Um, the other questions, I think, 
summarize in the tradition of Berkeley activism is they're saying, okay, you've motivated me. You're, as a magazine, perhaps your readership doesn't like to, uh, you're including what you can do next, but a number of people are saying, based on what you saw out of this water issue, where would you tell me to apply myself and my own energy? Uh, what seemed most critical and where could I do uh, something to help the world in the water situation that you're depicting? A good question, uh, and, and of course, I mean, again, I, I want to emphasize uh, National Geographic magazine, uh, at least under my editorship, is, is not a, a magazine of advocacy. You know, we're hopefully a, a magazine of enlightenment. And, and the, I, I don't say this um, casually because there are huge fights amongst our journalists. I mean, we have people like George Steinmetz who witnesses atrocities in southern Sudan, and he comes back changed. I mean, I, I witnessed atrocities before the genocide in Rwanda that, uh, between the Hutus and the Tutsis that changed me forever. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've sat down and spent hours uh, with Nelson Mandela who wrote the foreword to my book. And you know, that time and what Nelson Mandela's, for example, done in South Africa has changed me as a human being. It's changed the way I look at the world. And we, of course, want that reflected in the magazine. We want you to think about the world we live in. But as far as advocacy, where we stop and, and, and where we go with that, we're very careful with that and take a, a, a pretty traditional journalism line. But as, as a society, the Geographic, I, mean, I, I mentioned it earlier, gave money to start um, Sequoia National Park. We, we advocated uh, very strongly to the Congress to, to help create Save the Redwoods and Redwoods National Park. So we do have a spirit of activism, but there's a, a degree of separation from the rest of the society and the magazine in that regard. As far as water goes, uh, what do I think, um, what really touches me with water? And it goes back to, uh, I'm an ag major from Oregon State University. And when I went to school, uh, and this was reinforced to me the other day, I was having lunch with Lester Brown. Uh, and, and Lester, uh, is an ag major from Rutgers. <laughs> and w w when a lot of us went to school, if you were really interested in the environment, you were often an ag major uh, at a land grant university. And uh, you know, I, I, I take uh, a degree of pride and feel fortunate that I, I worked at a land grant university that gave me uh, that background. But uh, I, I would say when it comes to water, the thing that concerns me the most is, is water and agriculture. And, and by that, it, I'm painting a pretty, you know, the, the, the draining of aquifers, the, uh, the, the pollution of water from agricultural runoff, be it from, uh, in Delaware, from chicken farms to uh, nitrogen. I mean, there's, a, there's a, a, a story that we're working on, a nitrogen. I mean, nitrogen is one of the most interesting stories I can think of. I mean, here was this thing developed to make bombs, yet it was an incredibly important part, one of the main drivers in the Green Revolution, which the Green Revolution is responsible for, what do they say, 20% or, or more of the world's population as a result of the Green Revolution? But I used to work for a farmer in southern Oregon, Otto Bonert, and Otto, who was pouring nitrogen on his fields with the extension service, said, you know, I'm doing this because I can get 100 plus bushels per acre of wheat. Um, but you know, there's no free lunch and we're gonna pay a price for putting all that nitrogen. So agriculture in the United States, the way it's done now, and Michael Pollan here is at your, at your school, which I think is fabulous, is completely unsustainable. It can't carry on. I mean, so we've got genetically modified crops, which I, I'm in Berkeley, but frankly, I, I'm gonna agree with Stuart Brand you know, who, who uh, wrote the Whole Earth Catalog and just came out with a new book, and he said, you know, I was on the wrong side of that issue, and a lot of environmentalists were. Genetically modified crops are not a bad thing, and I think to feed the world's population, you're gonna need that in your toolkit. But to me, water and agriculture is one of the, one of the big untold stories and something we really, really have to pay attention to. I think that's a, a great way to wrap it up. Um, you do, I thought we have to be out by nine. No, we're okay. We can go.
Oh, okay. Uh, do we have a question there? Yeah, this is, um, I, I was really excited by the idea of the, the connection between spirit and life and, and water. But there's also this, this idea of law. And, uh, you know, I mean, you take your saving that water on the All-American Canal has absolutely um, made farming, you know, which had been depending on that uh, leakage, impossible. But, but that's their agriculture, not our agriculture. But um, I, I'm really interested in the, the whole notion of law and water and why um, the whole question of, you know, in many places, including the United States, water is held in trust mm -hmm. for future generations. And um, it's not something that you buy and sell. I mean, just like you don't have organ markets, you shouldn't have uh, water markets. And I was wondering, uh, why uh, why that one didn't uh, that aspect of water didn't show up in this uh, in this well, it, analysis? It, it does show up to some degree in, in um, the the California water story because of course law is a huge driver uh, and, and interest in water as a commodity is a huge driver in that. But um, you know we're, we're not we're not done talking about water. Uh, you know we're, we're going to carry on uh, and in. Uh, continue to cover water and, and uh, we'll do it because it's the right thing to do. The other thing we found with this issue is that it was an incredibly popular issue with readers. It was a, a big success commercially and it was a big success with advertisers. So I mean we, what we are hearing from people is we want to learn more about water and the, 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 the challenge for us at National Geographic Magazine to get into uh, the legal nature of water, which is fascinating and just as you say, incredibly important, is we are uh, a storytelling magazine that, that relies very heavily on visuals. And it's, it's a real challenge for us to, to photograph or to even, to some degree, even chart that story, although it could be with information graphics and mapping could be charted uh, and, and probably be pretty interesting. It just means we've got to be very creative in, in how we do it, but uh, your, your point's a very good one. I mean, I, I can't deny that. You're absolutely right. Someone over here? Yes, I have a quick comment and then a question. Uh, first, as a geologist, I wanted to thank your society for uh, highlighting in special issues the major challenges and things like energy, climate change, water. Uh, I think it's really important for our society uh, to be better uh, educated about these very serious issues. Uh, the question that I have is switching gears for you. Our children are the hope for the future, and yet in this country, I don't know what it's like internationally, there's a real problem with geographic uh, literacy and so I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit about some of the uh, educational programs that you have, especially for uh, the younger students. Well, this uh, uh, edu geography education is uh, uh, the chairman of our board, Gil Grosvenor. That, that's uh, the gentleman I mentioned earlier. That's one of his great passions. And, and it's actually shocking the degree of, of uh, ignorance uh, about geography worldwide, and, and it certainly is uh, prevalent in the United States, and I'm s sad to say more prevalent in the United States than a lot of other nations, especially in Europe. Uh, so he, uh, he's developed uh, uh, a geography education fund, and uh, we've done a lot of lobbying on, on Congress for funding. We've we, we funded a lot of geography education programs. We've, uh, one of the most successful things we've done is the National Geographic Geography Bee. Uh, which uh, has uh, now has expanded not just to the United States, but uh, is ex being expanded in Europe and, and through our partners. So that, uh, uh, with, with scholarships and uh, uh, children coming from uh, all 50 states and now expanding it internationally, uh, that's been a, a successful program uh, from sort of a grassroots level. Uh, but it's... it's uh, uh, it's also uh, one of our missions too is uh, we, we own uh, a company that uh, used to be called Hampton Brown and uh, they're involved with uh, uh, 
uh, English language education and increasingly moving into geography education and curriculums too. But it's a challenge because of school board budget cuts and uh, all the uh, stresses that have been put on schools uh, to have the quality of geography education that, that we really need. I mean, and the reality is, is uh, you know, how, how can you make good decisions uh, with a, a population that doesn't really understand ge uh, geography. So your, your, uh, your point's a good one, but this is uh, something we are actively involved in and, and very committed to, and, not, and don't just talk about it, but put uh, quite serious funding into. I had a question um, that I, I don't know if, if this is the most appropriate question for you to respond to, but I've heard you, I've looked at National Geographic magazine since I was a young child. And I really, one of the things that I really appreciate about the issues that addressed in them um, is a perspective on women's issues worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, in speaking tonight, I've heard you mention numerous um, researchers, staff members, um, photographers, people around the world um, that are working for National Geographic. And accounting, I heard mentioned three women's names. Um, and a very large number of men's names. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you could address sort of that kind of work, um, not only as, as National Geographic works in the world, but also on your staff sure. um, and in your organization. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to sound defensive uh, because this is, uh, as, as, a, as a father of two daughters, uh, this is uh, very important to me. My deputy, uh, uh, is a woman, uh, Victoria Pope. She's in charge of, of uh, basically her responsibilities, uh, every word that goes into National Geographic magazine. Uh, the managing editor of the magazines, a woman, Leslie Rogers. Uh, the, uh, uh, there will be a promotion uh, soon uh, uh, in photography uh, for a woman. Uh, about half of the staff at National Geographic magazine uh, it, it are, are women. and. Um, and not just uh, in the lower level jobs. Uh, one of my great wishes as the editor of the magazine would be to, to, to pass uh, uh, my job on to a woman. Uh, it would be terrific to pass it on to a person of, of color as well because it, uh, it's, it's been a, a pretty male dominated organization. But at the magazine, uh, we certainly, uh, on the staff, I think represent women really well. Um, and and uh, there's certainly value contributors uh, and colleagues from my perspective. Uh, in photography, um, we have uh, in the field right now roughly 20% of the women out, uh, photographers out shooting at any one time are women. Um, I wish it was more than that. Uh, and there, there are stories, uh, many stories, where a woman's uh, perspective uh, re really helps us. And, and we, we are deeply committed uh, to photographing women's issues. Lindsay Adario is photographing uh, uh, women in uh, Afghanistan right now. That, that'll be the angle uh, of that story that uh, one of the indicators as to stability in Afghanistan will be the status of women. Um, another one of our photographers, she just did the story in the uh, FLDS, the, the polygamous uh, Mormon breakaway church. Stephanie Sinclair is doing a, a really terrific story uh, in, in four of the world's major religions on child brides. Uh, and, and Stephanie is, is a, a, an incredibly, as Lindsay, is an incredibly courageous uh, photographers. So um, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, we want to do better and that, that's a very good question. One more. One, we have here. Sit down. Hello. Hi. Um, I saw a documentary uh, recently. This touches on the uh, water rights uh, laws and such. Uh, it was uh, 2008. Uh, it was titled Flow and it uh, touched on or dealt with uh, in, in large part with uh, two or three large corporations that are 
maneuvering to gain control of water rights, especially mm -hmm. in developing countries. And I'm wondering if your articles are going to uh, address that as well. Seems like there'd be good opportunity for photographs when you have people trekking, not only trekking these distances for water, but then having to put a cart into a well to get it to pump for a little while, that sort of thing. Thank you. Yes, I mean, the, the, again, in that continuing discussion on water, uh, that, that's an issue we'll explore. Another issue we'll explore um, was brought up this weekend. I, I, um, some foundations helped us with the water issue. And in these challenging journalistic times, um, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, we, we've seen uh, the Annenberg Foundation, who we've worked with in the past. I was just, in fact, yesterday uh, in a meeting with Wallace Annenberg. Uh, she supports NPR uh, and public broadcasting in general. Um, and uh, another person that helped support the water issue was Howard Buffett, Warren Buffett's son. And, and Howard's passion is um, agriculture and feeding the world in, 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 in creative ways. And he and I talked a lot about another issue that's similar to this, and that's that uh, uh, in some cases the Chinese coming in, but multinational corporations coming in and at bargain basement prices buying up the world's farmland. Uh, and, and, and leveraging it and you know, all kinds of Goldman Sachs kinds of schemes uh, you know, that, 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 are, that are, are frightening. And uh, you know, it's interesting because his dad being Warren and stuff, he gets these offers. And uh, you know, he's going, you know, the, the ramifications of this could be huge. You know, farmlands being bought up in, uh, at bargain basement prices in Zimbabwe, for example. Zimbabwe, uh, prior to Mugabe's uh, uh, redistribution of, of land to his cronies, um, was a, a, a food exporter and now is a food importer. Uh, but the Chinese are coming in and, and buying land there. And I, I'm not disparaging the Chinese. I mean, this is not unique to them. But there's, uh, you know, there's some real resource grabs going on throughout the world that we've really got to pay attention to uh, for, for the sake of humanity. You're absolutely right. Oh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, sort of say, uh, National Geographic was certainly a part of all of our childhoods. As we found out, as a group of scientists were waiting to have you dinner with you last night, it's also a part of our current reading of every scientist that came to meet you. Is we, we didn't well, realize that in advance. Um, and thank you, especially for focusing on issues like water, which I have to admit has a special meaning for me uh, ever since the day when I asked my father what his earliest memory was and it was as a child in Pahuska, Oklahoma, helping my grandmother hang wet sheets over the windows sure, to keep sure. the dust from the Dust Bowl sure, out. Sure. And you know, this is an issue that is an enduring issue for us, and your highlighting is, is very valuable to society. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for inviting me.